Greetings, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades. Happy Easter Wednesday. We are doing a bit of cleanup here on Easter week. Over the last two weeks, uh, the beginning of the Passion Tide and Holy Week, lots of stuff was in the news that I normally would have covered, but I was trying to keep Rules for Retrogrades episodes clean, clean as God's fingers, as they say, so that we could focus on the Passion Tide. But there was a topic that came up one to two weeks ago that is very interesting that involves many of those items in our wheelhouse here on Rules for Retrogrades that I would have otherwise dealt with and I'm going to deal with now here on Clean Up Easter Week. Yes, I know there's a paradox in saying that we wanted to keep it absolutely G-rated during Passion Week and Holy Week, but not an Easter Week. No, I don't need you to, to point that out for me. We, we were really trying to be penitential then. The topic today is Dennis Prager, Jordan Peterson, and pornography. These two men, I would, I would start out with this little introductory segment. These two men, Dennis Prager and Jordan Peterson, non-Christians, are looked to as moral exemplars by young conservatives, many of whom are Christian, and it always shocks me. It scandalizes me, to be honest. And not much does. In the, in the Catholic world, I'm, I'm known for being the commentator that, that is hard to scandalize. Well, Peterson and Prager have done it, particularly with this conversation they had with a, uh, a fellow non-Catholic, a Protestant, on pornography and adultery and lust. And I, I think uh, Trent Horn commented on it. I, I, I'll address Trent in the closing remarks today. And he, he gave, I think, insightful remarks. But I have a way different take, even though we agree about conclusions. So I'll just say this. Why would a young Christian man, a young Christian conservative, why would a young Christian conservative woman, for that matter, look to Jordan Peterson or Dennis Prager for prudence advice? Why seek phronesis in those who, by definition, lack phronesis? If you can't even read the sign of the times, who cares if you can read the weather? That's what I would say. That's what Jesus said. And the sign of the times are every single conservative out there must be Christian, at the very least, to be taken seriously. Or else you should take them with a grain of salt. They really need to be Catholic. Furthermore, I mean in order to do politics and culture well, as I argue in Catholic Republic, they must be a conservative Catholic. And I simply am scandalized by Peterson Prager. I, I've expressed this before, and folks are like, well, they have the offer good advice in other realms. Okay. Let's get to it. Today, we're going to see what Peterson and Prager say on a technically non-religious article of the natural law. Lust, pornography, adultery. Adultery within natural marriage. So we're not just talking in terms of religious categories. Let's do it on today's show. First, I would just say this. If you want to support the show, you got to like and subscribe to the channel. Click the notification bell. Leave a comment. I like cookies is good enough. I'm seeing people saying, I like cookies when I look occasionally to the com boxes in other, even non-Catholic videos. It does the trick. Excellent. I do too. <laughs> and now that Lent is over, you can in indulge. Well but if you really want to support the channel, please support us, participate in things like the Women's Summit that Steph had during the last two weeks. That um, You can go to that on our YouTube page if you missed it. It was really good. Also, read the books associated with the four pillars of being a retrograde. Those are namely Catholic Republic, associated with all things conservative really are Catholic. Subsidiarity. Pillar number two, <laughs> patriarchy. We're talking about patriarchy a lot lately, and we're going to talk about it some at the end of today's show because it keeps coming up when other people are copying us and can barely keep our names out of their mouths. 
So read The Case for Patriarchy, of course, and also Ask Your Husband, the two books associated with this channel associated with prong two. Prong number three is education. The book is Don't Go to College, How to Have a Homeschooling Lifestyle based around not worrying about the benchmark tests that your kids would be getting in public or puppy mill Catholic education. Don't go to college. And fourthly, right-wing community organizing, and that book is this channel's namesake, Rules for Retrogrades. Buy those books. Finally, we've been canceled more than any other Catholic. I guess I should say I have been. I, Tim Gordon, have been canceled more than any other Catholic out there. I'm canceled from IRL jobs, from Patreon, even from wills. My birthrights have been canceled. All for speaking out on things like sexual ethics, divorce ethics. That's a big one in the Francis Pontificate, and that one makes a lot of people mad. And, of course, uh, competing monotheisms. Support me on Locals today, please. We really could use it. Or you can support me at timothyjgordon.com. That's not a support of my work. That's just a donation for a guy who is a dad with a webcam. Big family, handicapped daughter. If you want to support me and my daughters and my son and my wife as people, as fellow Catholics, go to timothyjgordon.com and click donate. But if you want to support the show, locals. Now, I'm going to play you some clips. Here's what you're listening to, okay? Dennis Prager, who runs Prager University, has a friendly association with places like Daily Wire, talking to Jordan Peterson, who's on the Daily Wire, justifying for a conservative, mostly Christian audience, justifying in the most dangerous terms, terms that are the moral equivalent of an attractive nuisance, a rusty playground you have in your front yard that will attract children, something that's vile, that is second only to feminism in rotting out the guts of this once Christian nation. Feminism's number one, pornography is number two. And there's obviously a connection between number one and number two, but I'm not really interested in that today. They are conceptually distinguishable. And here you have a a man of a non-Christian faith, Judaism, holding up as a really a moral good, a conditional moral good, pornography, which rotted out the guts of this formerly Christian nation. Now we're in decline. The cracks are in the wall. I've also heard Prager singing the praises of feminism. I've heard Ben Shapiro do the same thing, by the way. Of the two worst evils in society today. Not Skittles, not one Skittle color can become another Skittle color. I know, conservatives love talking about those. Skittles and one Skittle color can transmogrify into another. Those aren't it. It's feminism and porn. Feminism and porn. And he makes these evils, not not feminism in this case, but, but porn, feminism elsewhere, sound really, really okay. Conditionally good. Listen to what he says in this clip. Listen. And and thank you for beginning, Mr. Prager, with an affirmation that, you know, A and A prime are not the same letter. Obviously, Christianity and Judaism are not identical religions. Uh, and, and we have no equivalent that if you look upon another woman with lust, it's as if you have committed adultery with your heart. There's only one way to commit adultery in Judaism, and it's with a different organ. And I'm not being cute. I'm, I'm being very realistic. Uh, looking with lust is not a sin in Judaism. You could expound everything Jesus said from thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife or another woman you're not. Whatever. Well, you know, the whole point okay. of coveting, it begins in the heart. 
And I understand your Hebrew word for covered is a desire. It's a Christian. It doesn't stop halfway. Right, to it take. It takes action. It's to take. Yeah. It's not, there's no ban in the 613 laws of the Torah on lusting. No ban on lusting. So before we're talking about pornography, we're just talking about the, the canker, the little festual canker with pus that pornography grows from, usage of pornography grows from, lust, okay? And the Christian brings up this kind of distinction. Can you lust? Without becoming adulterous, I mean, there, we have a, such a thing in St. Augustine as a verbal act. Is this like a verbal act? Well, St. Augustine's a Christian. What about for the Jews? And Prager affirms robustly, there is no, in, in all of the Jewish laws, there is nothing against the act of the, it's, as a matter of fact, it's an act of the will. To engage in lust. It's not an act of the will if you, for for one second, see a woman in a booby shirt and you're like, I need to turn away. But it's an act of the will if you're like, oh, a booby shirt. I'm going to hone in on that. I'm going to look at this and enjoy it. I'm not going to <laughs> seek the act of adultery with this woman, but I'm going to enjoy viewing this. And every man knows that this is a, an attractive nuisance in our day because women, generally speaking, are, are awful and run around in these, generally speaking, run around in such clothing everywhere. The bank, the market, the gym, we all know it. I'm not, I'm not going to beat you over the head with things you already know. That's one thing we don't do here that other places do. You know what we're talking about. So he, he asserts, he'll assert it when he actually is talking about porn, Prager will, that men want variety. Natural fact. Women are indulging their visual acuity with variety by the very dint of the fact that these are not your wife's breasts, right? <laughs> and, and here, look at them. So is this a, a natural fact? Yes, men are attracted to variety. Aquinas says... This is why even polygamy, which was allowed in the Old Testament, in the strict sense, does not violate the natural law. It violates the eternal law. In another sense, it'll violate the natural law. He says it's half-half, Aquinas says this, because you have to deal with it because the Jews in the Old Testament actually sated their seeking before Moses for variety. So you got to do something with that. Abraham to Moses. Abrahamically to mosaically speaking, you have to deal with the fact that not only did men want variety, but they were allowed to have variety maritally, sexually. They're allowed to indulge it. Well, after Moses, even the likes of Dennis Prager will admit that men will have an unsatisfied yearning for variety. Except... Except, here's the cognitive dissonance. It's what today's show is all about. You can satisfy part of it. You can scratch a little bit of the itch. You can scratch around the itch. Just don't scratch the red bump itself. You can look. You can look. And enjoy. And, and sinfully uh, bespoil yourself with uh, disgusting thoughts. Vile thoughts. That no saint ha hold, harnesses these thoughts. No saint harbors these feelings on his way to heaven. No. So is there moral neutrality in the proposition that men want variety? This you'll hear torturing Dennis Prager, making a liar of him as he goes along and as he actually moves into the realm of the discussion of lust in act, lust in actuality, which is pornography or adultery. He'll say no to adultery, but lust in act... Version A, pornography, he'll say, yes, you can. Really quickly, before we move into the section on lust and act, the Christian says, well, there's this tricky relationship, even in the Old Testament, by the commandment not to covet. Now, we have two, four of the commands in the Decalogue. 
given to Moses. Four of them, two couplets. Let's consider them. Prager's answer does not avail. Prager goes to an etymology and he says, this is why we Jews are allowed to do it. I'm not saying that he's wrong. Jews seem to be allowed to engage in lust and pornography. Well, we're going we're gonna to tend to that. It seems to be one of the many major dichotomous distinctions between Christians and Jews. There are so many. In fact, the term Judeo-Christianity is a uh, farce. But think of the four commandments. Thou shalt not covet your neighbor's goods. Thou shalt not steal. That's a couplet. Thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Those are two couplets. Do you see where I'm going? It's relatively obvious. The Christian asked Prager, well, what is coveting if not a sort of act of the will that is in disordered desire? He's not a Catholic, so he didn't put it in as elegant Thomistic terms as that, but an act of will that is an act of disordered desire. Isn't that what coveting really is? And, and Prager answers, and I'm paraphrasing, no, covet always means to desire then take. You see where I'm going with this? Logicians, the principle of parsimony always takes. The house always takes. What is the principle of parsimony? No redundancies. Are you saying, Dennis Prager, and I guess all the, the Jewish people who agree with Dennis Prager about the Decalogue, are you saying there's the, the rule of parsimony does not apply to the Ten Commandments? You're saying that God has relatively foolish redundancy as between these two couplets in four of the commandments? I don't think so. I'm not imputing foolishness to God, but you are. Dennis Prager. So, thou shalt not covet your neighbor's wife, and thou shalt not commit adultery, are wholly indistinguishable. And since they are distinguished as fully separate commands of 10, it's not like they're out of 613, they're two out of 10, then you are charging that God gave to Moses a distinction without a difference. If Dennis Prager and the Jews are right, thou shalt not covet thy neighbor's wife means the exact same thing as thou shalt not take thy neighbor's wife. How is that not a distinction without a difference? Apply it to goods and you have uh, exact same thing, pace uh, uh, inanimate objects. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not covet, Prager says it means take thy neighbor's goods. Am I missing something here? Nope. No. Now, now, I, now, I'm not saying that Prager's etymological explanation for covering the ground, the, the explanatory gap, is wrong qua the Jews reading the Old Testament. I'm saying the Jews reading the Old Testament are obviously deficient and wrong. And I just proved it to you with a little heuristic using the Ten Commandments. The principle of parsimony certainly applies to something as important as the Ten Commandments. Commandment one, thou shalt have no other gods besides me. Commandment two, you're not allowed to have false gods besides me. Commandment three, don't have false idols besides me. Well, that, this is God. This is God here. He's like, hey guys, it's me, God. The principle of parsimony is a first principle. That is a logical axiom. I'm not going to give you 10 commands that are really eight because two of them are redundancies. Come on, get out. you're out of your mind. Now, let's listen to what Prager will actually say about porn, which is a logical extension of what he says about the usefulness, the conditional good, of lusting for women besides your wife, it's just gross. It's just gross. You're not, this is something teens do. You know another thing teens do? They rationalize evil, not conditional evil, but categorical evil, like lusting for women besides your wife. I know, I'll talk about this at the end of today's show. Guys like Horn and Frad characterize this channel as macho, but hey, look, 
I agree with them. And by the way, over the course of the next year, I'm going to be helping to roll out an anti-porn attack program that will blow your minds, that will blow up the internet. You can remember I said so. Porn, simplicitaire, vile. Lust, even, even lusting, absent the use of porn. Lusting, I, I, there, there's a whole slew of terms. Fantasizing with just your thoughts about women besides your wife, even fantasizing about your wife itself without the presence of your wife is evil. And by the way, as we say on C-Mask on Fridays, it's not macho. It's not cool. I mean, I feel like a Saturday morning cartoon special, but I get accused, accused of the machismo a lot by uh, glib speakers, and it's vile. And we stand against it more than anyone. And I am very proud to partner with a very successful young friend who is going to largely end internet porn. That's a big promise. You'll find out more about it this year. We've always got multiple irons in the fire here on Rules for Retrogrades. It's going to destroy porn. It's also going to blow out of the water weak little anti-porn software like Covenant Eyes. Get ready. Because this ain't funny. My name's Mike D and I'm about to get money. All right. Okay, here we go. Let's get money. Um... Okay, so here's Prager on porn. Mike D, also, also a Jew. I wonder what his view of porn is. Awesome. I'll bet I could guess. Okay, here we go. I'm a Beastie Boys fan. What can I say? I always ask if a wife calls me and says, my husband looks at pornography. I, I, I found on his computer. I have one question. How is your in life of intimacy with your husband? Oof. Is it good? In other words, is the pornography in lieu of you or in addition to you? Mm -hmm. Gross. Okay, now, more cognitive dissonance from Dennis Prager. And I have people tell me that he's, he's fast on the uptake. When I used to teach at Los Angeles Community Colleges, when I used to commute specifically to Compton Community College, I was coming straight out of Compton, Biatch. <laughs> That's where I started teaching. My first classroom I ever taught in was Compton Community College, teaching Plato and Aristotle to gangsters. It was actually a good time. Steph would come with me. And uh, I'd, I'd hide her in a bomb shelter in the, below the school, right? I would hear Dennis Prager. I mean, he seems wise if you don't know what to listen for. But he says he'll get why, And I remember him saying this like 17 years ago because he would get these calls. Wives would call in and they're like, I found my husband betraying me. Yeah, I found it in the most common place sweeping America. 98% of all men have looked at porn in the last six weeks or something like that. Something vile. You guys are cream puffs if you look at porn, by the way. You're disgusting. Stop. And, you know, the, com the computer files. And he would say, whoa, 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 whoa. Does this, it, before you begin, now I know, I know murder you might think is wrong, just substitute pornography for murder. I know you might think murder is wrong, but is it a useful murder? You see what I'm saying? Could you profit by this murder in some way? Could your marriage profit by the murder? Why are you saying murder is so wrong, lady? I have to ask a first question. Is it a uh, a murder that has great utility to you together with your husband. Now, the correct answer with grave categorical evils, the Thomistic answer is all utility that stems from grave evils are illusory. They're illusory utility. I'm not saying that if you commit murder as a hitman, you're not actually getting paid X thousand dollars. I'm saying it's an illusory good that flows from the X thousand dollars you're paid. You're solidifying your membership in the fraternity of hell. You are doing damage to your own soul. You are not engaged in virtue ethics, the transformation of vice through incontinence to continence to true virtue, which is the point of being a human being, naturally. 
the point of being a human being metaphysically is uh, seeking reunion with Christ. But so now if we take away the substitution, Prager says, is there some good, I say it's illusory, that you think you can get from letting your husband cheat on you with lustful thoughts of other women, whether they're platonic images in, it's a gross term, ladies, men call it the spank bank, or by looking at actual images. If it, if, if it seems profitable, then he should continue poisoning his soul, your marriage, and even your soul. Maybe he'll ask you to join him sometime so you won't be left out in the cold. Right? You don't want to be left out in the cold, like the closing scene of The Godfather. He might invite you into this poison. That's the best case scenario, I guess, if we see Dennis Prager's thought to its rational conclusion. I remember a, a friend of mine once said this to me. Uh, it's a, it's a extended family. Said, oh, I'm seeing a guy. He's badly addicted to porn, but he invited me in to the world. Or it might have been, it might have been uh, strip clubs. But don't even get me started on strip clubs. I, it makes me, it hard for me to watch the NBA. I'm a basketball lover. These guys are all addicted to strip clubs. Can you say James Harden? He has to know where the nearest four strip clubs are in every city in America that he plays in. It's disgusting. These guys are cream puffs. It's why they can't come back from injuries, Zion Williamson, because they're soft. Soft, cucky men with low T are addicted to porn. It's gross. Guys like MJ, at least the first part of his career, never would step out to the strip clubs. Refuse to. These are the kind of guys that can play on a broken foot or play with the flu. So even if there were moral neutrality to the proposition that men want variety, as it seems to have, because it is true on a natural basis, it doesn't have moral neutrality when we apply the natural law to the proposition. Man's natural reason, together with Christ's new law, says we're not supposed to seek variety either with our eyes or with our organs. This is a gross point that, that, uh, that he also makes, right? Prager, he's like, adultery requires the actual organ, the act of two organs. This is nonsense. This is the sheerest utter rubbish. And young conservative Christians are listening to this and heeding it, I think. My, my extended family member was a Christian when she told me, I was a Catholic when she told me that. You know better than that. Ladies, I'm not known as a feminist, but porn, if you consider it for a half a minute upstream of the way you find it or downstream of the way you find it, pornography and its usage, it involves horrible life style, horrible life accoutrements for Everybody involved in it. I don't just mean the women, but yeah, especially the women. I mean the producers. This is poisoning their soul. I mean the viewers downstream of it. It's poisoning and addicting them to toxin. How can a conservative elder, one of the topmost conservative elders, the eldest of the conservative elders, who is advised like a marriage therapist half the time. I used to listen to his show some because I had nothing else on AM radio before everything was digitized. He's consulted like a quasi-religious, quasi-psychotherapeutic expert, Dennis Prager. And we have Catholics endorsing his work all the time. Stop. Stop listening to this. He is one of the purveyors of the porn lie. So is Peterson. So is Peterson. It's not acceptable. Stop. Just as it's wrong to subsidize pornography, it's wrong to continue to subsidize those who push pornography. And this is a soft push. Listen to what Peterson says. 
looking with lust is not a sin in Judaism. What's the stance on porno what's the stance on pornography? This is Peterson. So pornography when I'm asked this question, you, just to you, put you on the spot, you the did way. indeed. Uh, and I know this is not a religious answer, and I, I'm not even giving a religious answer. I'm giving what I think is a moral and realistic answer. First off, before he gives his answer, he does. He's not consulted as a religious expert. He's consulted as, I guess, in some ways, as I am from time to time. Though he, he's got a bigger platform. An expert who is religious, he's not an atheist, he's a monotheist, he's a practicing uh, uh, Jew, who knows about a few different fields, again, similarities to myself, and when people ask phronesis questions, practical life questions, they're expecting him to draw across all categories. This advice will be predicable across all categories, so don't give me that. This is not a religious answer. It's supposed to be predicable across all categories. So don't give me that nonsense. What's the, on, what's the stance on pornography? So pornography, when I'm asked this question... You, Just to you, put you on the spot. You the did way. indeed. Uh, and I know this is not a religious answer. and I, I'm not even giving a religious answer. I'm giving what I think is a moral and realistic answer. Men want variety. And uh, if adultery is a substitute for, if pornography is a substitute for one's wife, it's awful. If it's a substitute for adultery, it's not awful. That's, that is my unpredictable answer. Well, there is a clinical rule of thumb that's akin to that, I would say. If you're trying to decide clinically whether someone's partaking in a habit, say use of alcohol, has reached the threshold of clinical significance, one of the things you do is ask the, the person you're assessing, you know, is it interfering with your employment? Has it got you in trouble with the law? Is your family complaining? Does it stop you from doing other things that you should be doing? And so the judgment isn't the use of the forbidden substance itself. It's, it is in some sense consequentialist. And I'm not saying that that's an absolute, but it is a, it is a hallmark right. of clinical judgment. So I would just ask, you asked me about pornography. So this man was faithful to a wife with whom he could not have relations, obviously, the question. for a decade or more. I, may have, I think it went to 15 years. Would he have been wrong in relieving his sexual tension uh, uh, with, with, a, with a photograph? Yes. I have six... Now, that, so, okay, so there, there's uh, I, <laughs> a couple things. Petitio Principio. This is classic begging the question. Two gold miners stumble upon three pieces of gold. A says, aha, that's two for me and one for you. And B says, why is that one for me and two for you? And he says, uh, A says, because I'm the leader of this outfit. And B says, we never established that. What makes you leader of this outfit? And then A says, because I have more gold, right? You're using the premises to justify the conclusion and the conclusion to justify the premises. It's called a petitio principio. We teach it as logic uh, professors. And uh, unfortunately, it hasn't been taught to Mr. Prager. He says, well, conclude what he, he's, he's uh, presuming what he set out to prove. He says, well, this guy who uses porn is being faithful to his wife. No, he's not. That's, you're presuming what you set out to prove. And you can't prove it because it's a categorical evil. So he's not being faithful to his wife. There's not really any moral, morally meaningful sense in which cheating with a picture of Betty Sue down the street is any better than cheating with Betty Sue down the street herself. Well, there's the risk of pregnancy. That's what Prager, with his big booming voice, well, there's a risk of pregnancy that's avoided. Okay, that's a practical consequence most people who cheat on their wives, most cheaters would want to avoid. You could, you could introduce abortion as a solution, too, if, once you go down Prager's route. Morally, there's not much distinction between cheating with a picture and cheating with the woman themselves. Now, I, I could introduce some atomistic ways that it's worse, but there's some atomistic ways that it's actually better to have to go out and actually seek a prostitute to cheat with. So there's the question begging, and it's pathetic that he's regarded as an elder and he can't even answer this. Now, there's also the question of moral neutrality. Well, there's an assertion 
tacitly of moral neutrality between is someone using pornography, a married man, uh, to avoid his wife? That would be bad. Or is he using pornography to avoid adultery? That would be good. And, and Peterson says, oh, I don't want to accuse you of this, but is this not consequentialist? That is consequentialism simplicitaire. I don't know why he didn't implement it. Instead, he endorsed the consequentialism, which means, you know, relativism, basically. It's, it's a fancy, more logically connective way of saying relativism. And it is. Instead of condemning it, he jumped on board. If you can't beat him, join him. Did you want to say something, Steph? Yes. I. It was particularly aggravating when he started saying that you could use pornography not as a substitution to your wife or in particularly that you're not you're not cheating on her. You're just using this as an outside measure. He completely takes he takes away the entire point of marriage and that is communication with your spouse if you're needing pornography because your wife or she's not doing something that you like to do then you need you need to talk to your wife about that not use an outside measure he's saying oh well i'm using this so i don't end up committing or a man doesn't end up committing adultery what about communication why not just tell your wife i need you to lose a few pounds i need you to dress a little more more cute around the house just avoiding that conversation and using pornography is so disrespectful to a marriage it, it, well wait wait hold on i want to keep your womanly opinion here it takes bravery to say, hey, look, we probably both need to lose five or 10 pounds. That'll make it better for me. Because ladies, I'm just, again, I'll, I'll be the dark knight. It does make it better for the man that, you know, and, and it is a hard conversation to have if you love your wife because you know you want to be sensitive. But what a coward to just be like, hey, what, a, what a vile coward. Nice guys are mean. I always say this and people don't know what I mean. Nice guys are mean. Nice guys do this stuff. Mean guys are often nice, except don't don't revel in the meanness. You gotta blunt guys are nice. Like mean look, guys, yeah, go ahead. Mean mean guys are the ones that don't have those conversations with their wives, so they can desire their wives fully, and then go off and watch porn. Right. Those are the creep weirdos. Those are the ninety eight point five. I think most women would rather have a a hard conversation with their husband about what his sexual preferences are or things that they could do better to change to satisfy their husbands than have their husbands sneaking off and watching porn like a creep weirdo. Yeah. If That's husband, more hurtful than anything. What's more hurtful than being told you need to lose five pounds is that your husband has a crippling pornography addiction because he likes variety or because he doesn't want to just have a real conversation with you about what he requires. Yeah. Nice guys are mean. The nice guys are like, oh, I didn't want to hurt her feelings, so I just, I, I, I buy mountains of porn, or I, it's all online now, it's on their phone. What about, I want to keep you in here for a second. Okay, it doesn't matter how, according to the proposition, men want variety, direct quote from, from uh, Prager, which is, which is true. I'm not throwing him under the bus and saying, well, this is absolutely not morally neutral, if we say state it as a potential vice, men are attracted to moral neutrality. Even if your wife is everything you want, you have great communication, ideal weight, ideal. I, I don't even need to go into all that. You have a really close relationship, and all everything's all pistons are firing. Vicious men have not uncoupled their preferences their will from disordered desires from multiples. So just deal with that from a woman's perspective. I mean, like part of virtue is men are like, no, I, I want, I want my wife and my wife alone. You have to train yourself over the course of a marriage. So you're, you're talking specifically about the fallen nature or this, or just the nature of men wanting variety. Because what I'm what hearing, say. what I'm hearing him say is that, um, it, it, it treats men so disrespectfully and that they're just like animals, that they can't control their lusts, their thoughts, or their feelings. They're, that just giving a, a gigantic pass to a man because yes, men are visual. Yes, men prefer variety. Who doesn't know that? But what's crazy is that you have a man with gray hair who's supposedly an elder who is sitting at a desk 
uh, being, I'm sure, paid a lot of money to give his ideas to the world. And he's saying, men, we all know we can't control ourselves. We're just like amoebas with eyeballs in our heads. And we can't do any, we can't do anything moral when it comes to what our desires are. That's so disrespectful to men. And the men that I know personally, that that young men who are even unmarried, who don't use pornography, who are not sleeping around. And here we have a man, an elder man who's in a marriage. And he's saying, and he's saying, oh yeah, use pornography. How disrespectful to these young men out there that aren't doing any of that, that aren't even married. Also, here's another danger. Uh, I, I don't know this, I'm purely speculating. Any man that will admit this much publicly mm -hmm. to an audience of hundreds of thousands or a million, Apply iceberg theory. If you'll admit this much sexual perversion, what kind of 90% of the iceberg is beneath that cool icy water? I, I, <laughs> it ain't so pretty. Even, you know, I've got clear vision to see through the icy blue water and I think there's a lot more perversion that's not being intoned. Uh, if you're willing to intone this much, if you're willing to admit this much, gross. Gro and again, aren't you a gray-haired elder? Aren't you like 70 or 75? People should demand more. It, and then I'm going to move on. Yeah, it reminds me of what Tim and I always talk about when you go out to dinner with what we call a food thinker. And it's somebody who just, when you're sitting down to a meal with, with people, the purpose of the meal is to communicate you know, have a nice time with other human beings. It's not about the food. And what the food thinker does is they come out to dinner and all they want to do is they look at, they look straight at the menu. They're like waiting for their, uh, their chicken hawk in the, the door to the, to the kitchen to see if the food's coming through. All they're doing is, all they're there for is for the food. And the whole time Tim was playing these clips from Dennis Prager, I was just like, gross. This is like the food thinker, but with porn. It's just disgusting. You could just see somebody's enraptured with the idea of food or pornography. And it's gross. It's so gross. In my world, what I envision, since the FBI is listening anyway, is a world of patriarchy. <laughs> young men, young Princelings who are becoming kings, not not in some LARPy monarchist way. You live in America under a constitutional system. Get used to it. But princelings who are growing into strong, virtuous, loving, manly, husbandly kings of their own home who have beautiful, happy, intelligent wives who honor them and they honor each other and their marriages are all strong and models of the Trinity and who harbor the proper anger for feminism and pornography and all the vices that killed our country. They killed our country, okay? You gotta be strong. There was this tweet from a few weeks back that went like, uh, young women don't date men that look at porn. And I would say, here, well, here's how I responded to it. I completely agree. Young women should, it's not like you can ask on the first date, well, do you look at porn? That's kind of gross. But I would say yes. And also, do not date a, a young man if he regularly, or if he ever frequents strip clubs. Strip clubs, porn, that's not a king. Okay? But... By the same token, men, we have, you should implement some standards with a high bar yourselves. Let me read you what, what we said. It's funny when you can tell someone's scanning for something. This Twitter, Julie at Julie writes, says, women should refuse to date men who watch porn. And I said, agreed. Also, men should refuse to date women who have careers play sports seriously, or believe in mutual submission. What kind of world would we have if women refused to date perverts who watched porn? Because they're gross. Men who watch porn are gross. And they're cowards. And they're cowards, and they're gutless, and they're toothless. And they wouldn't fight to defend you. Probably never been in a fight in their lives, most of them. I mean, a lot of men who watch porn do, but... 
they're gross. Yeah, you're damn straight, sister. But we have some, now those of us who don't watch porn are going to have some demands of our own as the kings. You're, you might be the queen in your own imagination, in your future home, hopefully. But the king, well, his druthers matter as much and more. Men should refuse to date women who have careers, play sports seriously, I should have said, or believe in mutual submission. So na 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 na, right? That, I mean, everyone has preferences, and those are well ordered ones. Women out there, do not ever let a man gaslight you into saying porn or strip clubs or even just lustful fantasizing are normal. They're not. Don't listen to Dennis Prager. So far, okay, I want to I want to switch tones. Really, really, this is sort of consider this the concluding segment. So far, I've been assuming that Prager has partial truth but full willingness to engage that partial truth as far as it'll go be because he's he's got a deficient religion. All, all non-Catholic faiths are, and I will we'll just say all non-Christian faiths are deficient faiths. Obviously, Protestantism is false. Roman Catholics and Eastern Orthodox have a lot, a lot, a lot of all this stuff in common. So I, no shade there. But I've been assuming in good faith, charitably, that, that, I always want to call Dennis Prager Norm Hitzkiss, who was an old Dallas sportsman. And I, 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 Norm Hitzkiss. <laughs> I've been assuming partial truth. You know, he doesn't have perfect access to what the intellect should be adequating ratio through the Roman Catholic faith, but he has a full willingness to engage as much truth as he has. And I'm not sure that's true. I mean, I know that Judaism seems to be okay with porn and, and lustful thoughts. But I'm, I'm gonna. Con I'm, I want to bring things back home to what Catholics say about these questions, porn and feminism. And I would just ask this: whenever I'm talking about Catholic influencers, what I'll always—it's an ugly truth, not as ugly as porn, but ugly. The first question is: Will this alienate the base? And that seems to be all influencers. So I'm sad to say it when it comes to Dennis Prager, Norm Hitzkiss. I, I'm, I'm a little bit, because he is smart, I'm a little worried that he can see past the clear contradiction in the mainline Jewish teaching on porn and lust, and he just doesn't want to upset the base. And the, his base is probably mainly Christians, if I think about it that way, but is he not wanting to alienate those in his own faith who would take issue with his taking issue with porn? On Friday... Last, it was actually Good Friday, I read this quote from Al Goldstein, uh, the publisher of Screw Magazine. Now, I don't think he's a religious practitioner, but he speaks for people like Dennis Prager. Here's what he said. This is a guy who, who started one of the first porno mags. The only reason that, hard bracket, we Jews are in pornography is that we think that Christ is bad, I'll say. Catholicism, he repeats, sucks. I'm not going to say that about Christ. We and I don't believe in authoritarianism, which he's imputing to Christ and the church. Pornography thus becomes a way of defiling Christian culture, and as it penetrates, he's having a bit of fun with words here, as it penetrates to the very heart of the American mainstream, and is no doubt consumed by those very same wasps. Catholics aren't wasps, and he knows that. Its subversive character becomes more charged. Thank you for the truth. You mix lies with truth there, Al Goldstein. And I, it just makes me wonder, because Dennis Prager is a smart guy, why can't you say, look, principle of parsimony, the things I pointed out, why would we have two separate couplets in the Decalogue? Not coveting goods, not coveting your neighbor's wife. Why would you even mention stealing and adultery? Doesn't make sense. Yes, I know you guys don't have Jesus, and Jesus is the one that connects the pretty simple dots. Look, you guys only had divorce for the hardness of your hearts. Now I'm taking away even lusting, which the post-Mosaic Jews were allowed for the hardness of their hearts. See, between Abraham and Moses, you're allowed divorce because of the hardness of the Israelite heart. Between Moses and Jesus, 
they were allowed to lust after women who weren't their wives, though they only had one wife for the hardness of the Israelite heart. Jesus is like, I'm raising the stakes on all of you. But it's not an unexpected move. You're given one wife, love her, love her well as a good husband and a king, and she'll love you back and you're, you'll have a dynamite time in the bedroom. That's how it's supposed to go. If you're not, you need some honest conversations. It's that damn simple. Well, I don't know. Maybe Prager's afraid of alienating his base. Now, I want to move into this question. If you can't trust Pragerson, you can't, Prager, you can't trust Peterson, why not just consume Catholic content all the time? People bring this up with me, and, and there's an answer. First, two things. Real estate for life. Get the hell out of your blue state if you're still in one. I never give you prudential advice. That's for the men, the fathers in the households to say, but this one is not even prudence. It's practically categorical. Get out of your blue states. Get to a red state today. Go to realestateforlife.org to help you do it. They make it really easy. Do it today. And the second thing is, there's a super chat question on the, on the porno. Yeah, on Jordan, Jordan Peterson here. Uh, Tim, I joined late. On this issue, I agree that porn and enabling of porn is evil. I'd like to know, though, if you believe Dr. Jordan Peterson is not a valuable ally in the culture war. I believe he is. I, I, well, I don't. I don't. I am... I remember Tommy Lee Jones in The Fugitive. Depending on your age, you probably don't. I don't bargain, as he whispers into the deafened ear of his uh, junior marshal, in the FBI, federal, federal marshal. I don't bargain. He hasn't proven valuable. He's been having this slow boat conversion for 10 years. And I think he's subsidizing the slow boat. If he, Look, I want everyone in the church. I want Dennis Prager in the church. I want Ben Shapiro in the church. I want Candace Owens in the church. I want Jordan Peterson in the church. I want all of them. Why? Not for our value. See, that's the thing. You're saying, how could they be useful to us? I love, as much as I can, in abstracto, I love their souls. I want them in the church. I want them to go to paradise. They can't go to paradise without joining the church. Do all four or five of the people I mentioned have talent? You bet. Would it be dope if they could take their talents and make and brand them Catholic, cross-brand them Catholic? Yes. That would be dope. But I'm trying to reason for the sake of the people. I, I'm not saying anything about, um, I, I do like Candace Owens. Um, pro probably she's my favorite of the, the people I mentioned. I, I'd love to talk to her um, and, and have some talks about feminism. But she's, she's probably my favorite of the people I mentioned. Uh, as for Shapiro and Prager and Peterson, I feel like there's, either antipathy toward Catholicism simplicitaire, or there is moolah in the slow boat to Catholicism. Sometimes it's more, they, they know it's true. How many times has uh, Shapiro had on Ed Fazer, one of the best minds under 60 in Catholicism? Many. You can't say no to that. The force of reason is a force majeure. I'm having a bit of fun because it's it's a, a man a man force versus a god force. But the point is, I feel like there's either antipathy there or subsidy there. There's there's val there's moral value in being Catholic adjacent that you might not have. You might sacrifice some dollars and cents. If you're actually no longer Catholic adjacent the way Peterson is, and you're just Catholic simplicitaire, you don't get the extra bucks. And I start to suspect it. You can't really, as Jordan Peterson, go on Bishop Barron's show anymore and make this whole, uh, start this whole wave of maybe he's becoming Catholic Fuhrer that you guys all, no offense, you guys all fall for like once a year. Jordan Peterson's coming into the church this Easter. Look, I want it for his soul. This does nothing for me. I'm happy for him and I'm hopeful for him. But I don't give in to these waves of uh, grandeur, delusion. Okay? So 
Yes, it would be cool to have them, but I don't think a lot of these people that are on the super slow boat to Catholicism want to take the fast track, and they should. Because you're not in until you're in. Were there other super chats or no? Not yet, no. Now, I, I'm not looking to subsidize. Look, this, and this is a nice segue into my closing segment today. I ain't looking to subsidize the truth. I ain't looking to be adjacent to a correct position because it's true. Lots of influencers know it. Being adjacent to the correct position, being nine-tenths right, is often more profitable than being fully right. Did you know that? So you guys don't know that. I didn't really know, it, know that before the last five years. Being partially wrong, but having your own category the way Jordan Peterson does, the way Joe Rogan does. Joe Rogan's a fat moron, right? I don't know why anyone would want to copy Joe Rogan's position because he's the biggest podcaster in the world. It's money, 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 money. I don't care, man. He's a moron. He's a pot-smoking moron. He doesn't know anything. And people actually envy that. I don't envy that at all. I don't care if your audience is a thousand times larger than mine. It probably is. Who gives a damn? What matters is the truth. But being adjacent to conservatism, true conservatism must be Catholic, that's the closing segment, is more profitable than if you're just another Catholic voice. Same thing with Jordan Peterson. Same thing with Douglas Murray. Same thing with... I mean, it's not quite the same with Jonathan Peugeot. But any of these Catholic adjacent guys are not getting it. And I don't mean Protestants or Eastern Orthodox, because at least they're Christian. They're Christian. And they're, they're, they're usually kind of just doing, doing their thing. But they're, they're fully Christian. I mean, they've had a Christian baptism. But so people say, okay, okay, I, I've just wrapped my head around what you're saying, Tim, about Peterson and, and um, Dennis Prager. So why not just consume all Catholic content all the time? Isn't that what you're advising? And I would say, well, no and yes. In the Catholic influencer world, there is an ugly three-headed hydra of a subsidy monster. And it's not being, well, it's, it's the Catholic analog to being truth adjacent to the Hyper-profitability of being truth-adjacent, in the sense I, I mentioned with regard to non-Christian, Christian-adjacents, like Rogan, Peterson, throw-in Prager. So we have the opposite problem in Roman Catholicism. We have a magisterium, which means everything, friends, is categorized, clear categories. We can't have abortion because of the catechism the three teaching problems of the church. We can't have feminism because of the Bible and the magisterium and the popes. We can't have pornography because of the three teaching prongs of the church. It doesn't take a genius to see it. Catholicism, yes, all the geniuses of the world are Catholic or, or Orthodox. I'll, I'll give them that. They're one of the two. But also, all of the blessed morons in the world are Catholic. I, and by blessed, I mean the truly blessed. There's room for everyone and everyone in between. Think of St. John Vianney. He couldn't pass his priestly boards. Okay, our opposite problem, the Dennis Pragers, if I'm being charitable, his problem is partial truth, full willingness to join the truth, is full truth but partial willingness to see it all the way through. Now, people write me all the time. I'm going to give you full disclosure here. I, and I don't consume their content regularly. But sometimes they'll write me and then I'll have to take a look. Or they'll just send me a clip. They'll say, Trent Horn and Matt Frad have converted to, to the Catholic truth on feminism, Tim. And I'll say, oh, that's great, I guess, but I'm skeptical. I'll say, have they? Um, riding the fence on a clear issue See so, yeah, how this is the opposite of Dennis Prager? Because it's not clear to Jews what the teaching on lesson porn is. But riding the fence on a clear issue like feminism or wifely submission as a Catholic, or worse yet, even ridiculing me for being first man in on these issues. 
riding the fence as the trailblazers do the heavy lifting and then later slow morphing slow morphing backing out your position as the catholic truth the one truth gains popularity seems to be the catholic way and this is what's happening this is what happens issue by issue it's been happening over the last months on feminism i said look transmogrified skittles that's the most recent issue but it's not the most important one it affects no one to be a transmogrified skittle you know what i mean to being a skittles a skittles person rainbow that's not the real issue there's a connection between lgb and t right gender dysphoria if you can be the opposite gender then you can this stems from the less extreme false teaching that came before it, that you can act like the opposite gender in the bedroom. But it doesn't end there. And the, the thesis of, I don't have the case for patriarchy in front of me, is that before either of those false ideas came down the pike, you had the original gender dysphoria. Not that you could truly, justly act like the opposite gender in the bedroom or that you could become the opposite gender ontologically, but rather that you can functionally serve out your life doing the things that the opposite gender is meant to do. Hmm. And what is that? The OG gender dysphoria is just feminism. So just yesterday, this cognitive dissonance was on full display on Matt Frad's show. This has happened a lot over the last year. Not so much since my book came out a year and a half ago, but really since Steph's book, Ask Your Husband, came out right around this time last year, a little over a year, 13 months ago. Caddy jabs have been thrown at, at my family, at Steph and me, over issues like that are very crystal clear, according to the one truth, natural law, and Catholic teaching, over wifely submission, um, womanly shame culture for out, out of control women who run everything nowadays, and wifely work outside the home. These are the probably the three big issues. Oh, also throw in there number four, uh, conjugal debt. That one's unexpected, conjugal debt in marriage. Tons of caddy jabs were thrown yesterday and yet people were saying, oh, did you hear some nice kinds of remarks? Yeah, I heard a real array of cognitive dissonance. And I've heard that increase over the last few months from other comments where people send me clips and stuff on Frad and Horn's shows, where in the popular culture, the case for patriarchy and ask your husband are preponderating. Currently, I tweeted this a while ago. I tweeted out, look, our views are preponderating. I don't do things to be popular. I say what I say because it's true. And I say it as a trailblazer before it's widely acknowledged as true. And that's great if it preponderates because most people will benefit by it. Most people will benefit by it. And that's what matters. But I don't care if it's popular, and that ought to be clear to people by now. What I, one thing I said a while back, beginning of April, I said, mark my words, all the Roman Catholic establishment cowards, I didn't have anyone specific in mind, who blacklisted us, I meant me and Steph, for re repopularizing the Christian truth about patriarchy will be quietly soft-peddling the concept in six months. And I said, in fact, it's already begun. I thought that so hard yesterday when I was getting all of these Again, it's a big audience for, for a Catholic audience, which is smaller. A, a lot of friends and, and distant well-wishers who might have gotten my number to text at one point were saying, oh, look, Frad and Horn have changed their minds, even though they, they ridiculed you four years ago and three years ago and two years ago and one year ago for just saying wives must submit. Shame culture is good for men and women, but especially women in this day. Wives cannot work outside the home. 
not just mothers, but wives. And the conjugal debt binds both husbands and wives. For those four truths, we've endured a lot of catty jabs and I haven't said much. And this is, this is as Frad and Horn slow, like I said, slowly, quietly soft pedal the notion that they changed their mind. And people will say, oh, praise God, that's, that's great. They're, they're converting to your point of view. And I said, well, wait a minute, wait a minute. A couple things. Remember one thing. We are nearly at the four-year anniversary of my appearance on both shows. And both were, were a big deal. My appearance on Horn, on Horn's show, we did a double debate on feminism and the death penalty. I'm just speaking truth, and I defended truth well those times. I've, I've had debates where I had a headache or had a cold or I fumbled the ball a little bit. I didn't that day. It was a good performance. And I had truth on my side. Death penalty, clear Catholic teaching. Catholic Church is very pro. Feminism, Catholic Church is very anti. And then I went on Frad's show. Actually, I went on Frad's in the summer and then Horn's in the fall, four-year anniversary upcoming. And it made both of them and their, their more normie audiences uncomfortable. And people have said, okay, we remember that. We remember both those. But before you write, this is the other half of my admonition, before you write me to say, Frad and Horn have converted in full humility, write them, Matt, and Trent to ask them if they have. Sounds like you converted on feminism. Are you no longer a soft Catholic feminist? By soft, I mean thin rather than thick feminism. Um, humility requires full admission of being wrong in the first place, apology for ridicule you hurtled at the correct one, and notorious, meaning open and outward, signposting in a reverse of value. You, Horn and Frad might not like Taylor Marshall much. Maybe they do. I don't know. Their audience might not like his audience much. But what Taylor Marshall did when I came on board with him in the fall and I was like, we need to go after Francis and we need to go after the Novus Ordo. And we started doing shows and then Marshall was like, you're right. I need to give an apology to some like Rorate Chele. He did it well. He admitted, he, he included all three steps of this. Admission of being wrong, apology for ridicule hurled, and notorious signposting in your personal reversal of value. He did all three parts. Horn and Frad seem to be trying to slowly moonwalk back. So they're like, this was our position all along. It doesn't work. You ridiculed us a lot. But here's the good part, which is kind of bad. Even as they're doing this on, on Frad's show yesterday, for instance, you had Laura Horn and Cameron Frad still taking little pot shots at me and my wife. Yeah, no, I people people were sending these um, clips, and again, like I, you know, I might have a more of a softer approach in, insofar as like it was not some of the things they said were legitimately nice, and I appreciated it. But some of the things, um, in particularly Laura Horn's commentable, does Stephanie Gordon ever challenge her husband? I just I found that pretty catty considering the fact we've invited them both on our show, Laura and Trent, because I'd like to talk to them about this, and they just won't appear here but then i hear my name being thrown around on other platforms platforms which by the way if you're gonna say nice things about me like i have yet to be it like invited to pints with aquinas about my book and my book has been talked about so much like in on these platforms so that's a little bit strange yeah, keep, keep her name out of your mouth until you want to do it. Go go listen to What's the Difference by Dr. Dre, first verse. It's easy Matt, to say. Keep our names out of your mouth if you don't want to have the talk. You had Abigail Favale on your show like a week after she was taking to Steph's book. Do you think we didn't hear about that? I mean, it's just in, in terms of fairness, I would say. Like it's if you're going to talk about us or our ideas or really just the church's ideas that we we're, we're just trying to push out there, then it's weird to speak so much and get no invitations, but I'll leave right. that aside. That's fine. But and what, denials of invitations. And and but I'll say this to Laura Horn specifically, if she if she sees this clip, she her her comment was yes, but do you think Stephanie Gordon ever challenges her husband? Laura, I don't need to challenge my husband because I married a, a really good man. Now on on major moral issues, 
of course I don't need to challenge him because I didn't marry a dirtbag who has bad ideas, who does immoral things. Now on prudential issues, and I say this a lot in my book, the instances where I have, I guess she would call challenge or approached him to have, you know, an idea or whatever you want to call it, it's extremely private. So no, of course, no one would ever know. And no one ought to know if a wife is approaching her husband to challenge him because A, it's weird and inappropriate to do that publicly. And B, that's not honoring your husband. If I have something I want to say to my husband, I don't even do it in front of our children. I do it very, very privately in our room where I'm saying, I think maybe we should go this way. And even then, when I do do that, Laura, I do it very respectfully. It is never a nagging, oh, you need to do this. Oh, I can't believe you did that. It's always very like, well, have you considered this? But again, to answer her question, no, I don't need to challenge my husband on moral issues because he's a great person. <laughs> I married a good guy. Well, the, the, the funny thing is, I, I mean, I'm sorry to have to point this out, but the funny thing is, but chal chal now challenging the authority, you're, you're pitching um, an evil as a good. When it, when it comes to making prudential decisions, I happen to be married to the wisest woman with a, with a crazy, crazy childhood that, that made her just bizarrely good at even dealing with manly things. Um, but just, she doesn't, even though she's the best head and shoulders above any other woman I've met at figuring out manly dilemmas because largely because of her unique childhood. Um, so that's that's all I'm going to say there. It's, it's personal stuff for Steph. But no, she doesn't challenge me because she knows, hey, Tim, Tim's going to listen to me if I raise some, some smart point because she's uniquely good, uniquely good at solving problems even in the, in the world of men. And, and other uh, Catholic masculinists know this about Steph. All the C mask guys I do my show is on like Steph's Steph's another case. But she does it, she's never annoying. She's never shrill. She knows to raise her point only once. Okay, if you don't want it, that's fine. She knows how much I respect her perspective. Now, con contrastingly, Lil Horn said, if and I, I mean this is, you know, I'm not I'm not reveling in this. This is something I'm I was concerned. She said, look, if if Trent spoke to me how I speak to him, we'd get a divorce. Well, that's, I, I don't take pleasure in that. That's a serious issue. But, you know, the passive aggressive Catholic thing to do would be to say, we'll pray for you. I'm just saying the, the marriage is probably sound, but that's a major issue. That comes from you challenging, which is an evil, an evil in a marriage. The wife should not be challenging. Doesn't mean she never raises her own ideas. Challenge is uh, an expression of rebellion. And, and maybe she was joking there, but I, and I'll also say my our guest Samantha, who I see in, ch in chat, hi Samantha, made a really great point during my summit, and she said that even when she asks her husband or mentions in a store like, oh, I love this dress. Her husband's such a loving man that he'll just throw, you know, put the dress in the cart. That's how Tim is even with my advice. So Laura, I also just pick and choose when I do choose to chime in because I know Tim cares a lot about what I say and I don't want to put a, a speed bump on on the road to him doing something that he wants to do unless it's absolutely crucial which again that does not come up often at all because I married a very moral person so I you know it's it makes me sad because I we, I, Tim and I, for our part, the, none of these feminism ideas are ours. This is just the church. And I'm just, I'm happy that we're, this is catching on. Um, I legitimately just want to be friendly with these people. And we've invited all of them um, to the show several times, actually. And we've gotten denied every time. Um, and now our invitations are, we haven't gotten invitations on our end too, but it's just weird. It's just weird to hear like all the, the, the conversations and, there's just no communication between the camps. Yeah, yeah, it's bad. And and bear in mind, we've we've hung out with the Freds. Um, and, and I've met Trent. I've never met Laura, but she's she seems like a nice woman when she's not talking about Steph and I. And I mean, we we could beg to differ as to what what good comedy is, but she she seems like a legitimately nice woman. It's hard to say that as someone's taking catty jabs at you and your family. I I would say. Girls always say, oh, we could have been friends, but it's, it's not a closed off possibility, right? 
Like we, we could be friends with both these couples and we have been friends with the frads. It's not too late. Just go listen to What's the Difference by Dr. Dre. First verse, like just, just take our names out of your mouths if you don't want to do direct dialogue. If you want to be friends, that always involves direct dialogue, private and public at this point, because you've created a scandal by talking about us every show on Pints with Aquinas over the last year, practically. Okay? So it's not too late. That, this is the thing. Steph and I are easy to, to make up with. We're easy people to make up with. We've dealt with some challenges in our lives, mainly the medical ones from our daughter, for my part. And it's, it's not that big of a deal, but we need Catholics to get on board with the truth. And if they're not willing to say, hey, look, these people were brave and were willing to be on board the truth and take a smaller audience for it. And that's admirable. And, you know, well, you know, we need people to admit. I, at the time, was more into having a large audience than speaking the truth. That's what all of this boils down to, folks. I, you guys don't think it's true, but it's even, it's more expressly expressed behind the scenes where people are like, oh man, I wish I would say that, but I don't think my audience would go for it. Same thing as what we were saying about maybe Dennis Prager. I don't know, you alienate a lot of the Jewish people in your audience if you come down on porn too hard. Well, you alienate as a Catholic all of the Catholic normies in your audience if you come down on feminism too hard. That's why they're soft pedaled backing into the, the true position, which is the Catholic Church stands for male dominion in the household, goodly male dominion in the household. Now, there is a solution to all this. And I would say, um, turn to... Catholics who are already in politics and culture. I think the Catholics who do Catholicism influencing suffer from this cowardice, and I can't say turn fully to them. But the Catholics who are doing politics and culture already, I would say like Matt Walsh and, and my friend Michael Knowles, uh, they seem to be doing the right mixture of politics and culture, such as to, to get most of this stuff right. Now, Ironically, both Walsh and Knowles took the Case for Patriarchy thesis on page two of the book. They took it on board. And ironically, it was on Matt Frad's show about a month ago, sometime in early March. It was evident that they had taken the thesis of Case for Patriarchy on board when they went on Frad's very show. And Frad was just sitting there like, huh, huh. They were, they, uh, it was Candace Owens' husband was like, yo, um, had so, said something about Catholic Republic. And Fred was like, oh, I, I've never read his book. I've never read that book. And, and then yesterday, Laura Horn brought up Steph's book or something. And he was like, well, I haven't read her book. It's, it's like ceremonial hand washing. Hey, Catholic normies, I haven't read their books. Don't blame me. But yeah, their books are true. But then later, the case for patriarchy thesis came up. The idea that feminism is the original transgender the original gender dysphoria. And I think I think Noel said something like, well, all four of us probably agree uh, that, that, that feminism is the original transgender. And I think I think Frad must have been off camera tugging at his collar. So let's, before you ask me and say, hey, look, this is so great, conversion in humility by Frad and Horn, just say, look, I've been on both their shows debating Horn and soft debating Frad both of those were about four years ago, three and a half years ago, right? And ask them, have you had a conversion or not? They're in a tough spot because the, the culture just began changing. Walsh and Knowles are doing it largely because they have such a vast audience and they've evidently gotten on board with, with Case for Patriarchy. So I think it's at that inflection point that <clears throat> Frad and uh, Frad and Horn are like, uh, should we show anti-feminist or should we show soft Catholic feminism, which has abided since the 60s? This soft Catholic parish Susan feminism. Susan from the parish council. Oh, we should have more women in it, but, but they can't be priests, but we should have more. That, that stuff has abided for 55 years. It's dead. That was a boomer thing. No one believes that anymore. People want patriarchy back. Christianity is bifurcated patriarchy, clerical patriarchy in the priesthood, household patriarchy in the lower sector. 
good men. We no longer laugh about porn or lust the way they laughed in the 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s, early 2000s. Ah, oh, it's and they weren't being patriarchs. Well, now men are getting off the porn. And I'm going to unroll a killer plan to get off the porn in the coming months. It is mind-blowingly good. But now people want patriarchy back. So ask them before you ask me. I couldn't rightly tell you. I don't know what's on everybody's heart. All I know is we're willing to be friends with everyone out there as we have been before. But you got to you got to listen to what's the difference. You got to you can't just keep avoiding conversation and then throwing some plaudits when it becomes popular, when it becomes popular spiked with some passive aggression because your wives are still mad that we were right and you were wrong. God bless you, Dazvolt. We'll see you next time, Parish Orphans and Retrogrades.